Teams do not win debates by having two more examples than the other team. Exa more examples are better than one single example because one single example might be an anomaly. Okay? What we are looking for with examples is that teams are able to demonstrate a general trend that supports a particular position. They can do this in one of a number of ways. They can either show that over time examples seem to support the same kind of argument. That is, my example from 30 years ago is the same or gives the same idea as my example from 10 years ago and my example from most recently. Similarly, trends can be shown across jurisdiction. So an example from China, an example from Kenya, an example from the USA, which all illustrate the same point, show a global trend. It's not restricted to one culture, to one environment, to one geographical location. So if examples are limited to one period of time, or one geographical location, they are usually going to be weaker examples in illustrating the general applicability of the point. What we want is demonstration of the trend. The more current the example, the more available it is in terms of general recall. Again, usually it has more strength. There's no point in a team giving you an example that only they could find after hours and hours of research because one of them is a Thai speaker and it's something that only people who speak Thai have access to. That's not persuasive because of the lack of general applicability and also because it's not something that the other team can engage with directly. So where examples are too esoteric, they tend to lose their persuasive power. Be aware, though, that some teams will have a tendency to use our examples in place of rather than to support argumentation. They expect the example to make the argument for them. That's poor debating. Examples on their own prove nothing. What we need is the logical analysis for which the example supports. The examples are simply a framework on which they hang their constructive argumentation. But it's that analysis, that theorizing, that really we should have in more regard to in terms of the content. The last thing you'll come to evaluate is clash. How well do the teams clash with each other in terms of their principled argumentation? Do they directly engage in terms of rebuttal and also in terms of their constructive material? Where teams don't clash, it is for you as judges to determine where the fault for that lies. Sometimes there is a lack of clash because the proposition failed to set up the right sort of debate. They don't interpret the motion in the most natural way possible, which is what David has asked them to do in his lecture, and therefore the opposing team cannot be expected to have prepared an opposition to that case. Other times it's the opposition's fault. They've decided that a debate is going to be about something, they've prepared an opposition to that something, and damn it, they're going to run that opposition whether it works or not. Okay? They had an example of this a couple of days ago in the debate about local food, where a gentleman from Romania had decided that this was a debate about protectionist policies. And that's what Proposition were going to run. Proposition ran a case that was about improving the health of citizens and giving them more nutritious food. And then Opposition ran an anti-protectionism case, which was lovely and really well structured and really logical and flowed and had nothing at all to do with the debate as it was presented by the Proposition. So although their fluid speaking was much better than the proposition, they just weren't engaging in the debate at all. Where arguments don't clash, it's up to you to determine which of those arguments are more central, more relevant to the debate, the topic as a whole. Again, you don't do that by having your own weird conception of the debate, but by what we would consider to be a natural interpretation of the wording of the motion. We've asked the students not to try to be too clever in terms of definitions, so that shouldn't be a problem. Okay? But where things say, think, where wording is uh, ambiguous, such as the local level, the most natural interpretation of that would be anything that is not the national level is somehow the local level. There are different degrees of local level, and different countries determine what the local level is differently. That might be municipalities or county administration or even state administration in a federalised country like Germany. 
But those are all examples of local level. They are all legitimate examples. Any attempt to restrict it to just one of those probably narrows the burden too much. And so anything below the national level is the most natural interpretation. So that's dealt with how to evaluate, or briefly, how to evaluate burdens, how to evaluate arguments, and how to evaluate clash. Secondly, we come to comparatives. What is it that makes one argument more important than another? Just as we've asked the debaters to engage in comparative analysis, we're asking the same of you as judges. Okay? You should be able, as educators, as debate coaches, to weigh up what you consider to be a strong, well-made, well-supported argument. This is particularly important where arguments don't directly clash where well, you must, might be asked to independently evaluate arguments, but you still have to then set them against other arguments in the debate to determine who's won. Okay? Most of that will have to do with relevance and centrality of arguments. How important to the debate as a whole were the arguments coming from each side? If the arguments are what you consider peripheral to the topic, they will have less weight in your judgment. If they are arguments that absolutely needed to be made, even if they were made poorly, that might increase their value in the debate as a whole. An argument that is central to the debate, but is not properly analysed, might sometimes outweigh a beautifully structured, well-analysed argument that doesn't have relevance. Okay? My personal feeling is that relevance is more important than the structure. We're not teaching them how to just repeat speeches. We're teaching them how to think about ideas that matter. And I think we should reflect that somewhere in our judging. It can become difficult when none of the arguments seem to clash at all. When both teams seem equally responsible for these ships passing in the night. In which case, how are you going to compare them? Well, fortunately, you're not just evaluating content. You're also evaluating things like speaking style and strategy. Those are the three areas into which the scoring breaks down, so that's what I'm going to move on to now, because that sometimes helps us make the comparative analysis. Okay, scoring. For those of you that have not scored world scores before, it is nominally a 100-point scale. Okay? Within that, we don't go below 60 and we don't go above 80, because apparently... You know, it's upsetting to kids if you give them a mark that's too low, and it's not good for kids if we consistently give them marks that are too high. They think they're perfect and they don't need to develop at all. It breaks down into three areas. We don't need you to provide scores in each area. We are simply looking for a total. Okay? Sometimes you will see ballots which have broken down areas for content, style, and strategy. I tend to call them idiot boxes. If you really, really need to judge on that level, you can. Mm -hmm. But you should have more of a holistic view of the debate, an overall view of the quality of the performance. If you want to focus on these three different areas to help you, if you're newer to the format, then we assign a maximum total of 40 marks to content, 40 marks to style, and 20 to strategy, giving us 100. What that means within our cap and collar of 60 and 80 is that you should give nothing less than 24 for content, nothing less than 24 for style, and nothing less than 12 for strategy, giving you a total of 60. That is true even if it is the worst speech in the history of the spoken word. If they stand up, vomit some words on the table, wipe their hands in it, and sit down, they still get 60 points for knowing how to breathe. Right? Similarly, if they stand up and give a speech that makes a barmer look like a slightly stupid child, they still only get 80. Even if it's the cheap speech that changes the world. It's the one that rouses the call to arms. There's a wonderful quotation from Quintilian when he was asked what makes the difference between a good and a great speech. He said, when Cicero spoke, all applauded and said what a fine speaker he was. When Demosthenes spoke, they said, now we must take up arms against Philip of Macedon. If the speech you are hearing makes you want to take up arms against one of the greatest military mites the history of the world has ever seen, still only gets 80 points, guys. Okay? We can't go above that. So maximum total for content, 32. 32 for style, 16 for strategy. All of that means 
that the average, and this is a slightly artificial construct, I know before you've even seen a speech, the average for this tournament as a whole should be 70 points. Okay, by the end of this tournament, when we come to do the meta-analysis of the speaker scores, we want the average mark to be somewhere around 70. What does that mean for you individually? It means that if the speech does what you would expect speakers of this level to do, and no more and no less, that's where you should be pitching your mark. It's a good idea to have that as a benchmark in your mind, and work up or down as they improve or you think they deserve marks taking off. Marks will be taken off for content that is irrelevant, content that is poorly explained, content that is not supported by an example. Style is their body language, their clarity of speech, how easy they are to understand, whether they let things like accent get in the way of their communication. Strategy might be things like the relevance of an argument or the position it puts the other team in in terms of demanding a response. Points of information. As I said, we do not adjust separately for points of information. At the World Schools Tournament they do, but it's a slightly weird metric. Only if the point of information is qualitatively different to the rest of the performance overall. So if someone gives a terrible constructive speech, but their points of information are brilliant, World Schools, they inflate by a maximum of two points. Similarly, if they give a blinding speech and terrible points of information, they knock off a maximum of two points. We don't. We evaluate points of information on the basis of content, style and strategy. Point of information might be incredibly good strategy, in which case it might increase their overall mark. It might have some of the best content for their side in the debate. If it's true, that's a little bit sad, but it's not unknown for it to happen that suddenly someone has a flash of inspiration long after they've finished speaking, and you sit there thinking, if only you'd said that during your speech. But it might still be good content worthy of evaluating as such. Now the 20 point scale that we end up with, because of these restrictions, is quite narrow. When you have to fit lots of speakers into that range, and there might be quite large differences between the quality of the speech that you hear. For that reason, and this is where I have a real issue with the scoring of World Schools, half points are acceptable. So we take a 100 point scale, which we narrow to 20 points, and then expand back out to 40 points by the introduction of half points. I understand the reasons for doing it, doesn't mean I agree with it, but it's what we do. Okay? So remember that your 60 to 80 goes up in half point increments. Okay? So if debates are very, very close, half points or one point wins between, or differences between speakers or even teams are perfectly legitimate. What we need you to do on the ballot, and each judge will fill out their own ballot, we have spaces because these are pro forma ballots for style, content and strategy, you don't need to fill those in. We just want a total for each speaker and for the reply speech. <coughs> two totals for the teams, and then the winner is the proposition or the opposition and the team name. Okay? And we have margins as well. You know, sometimes the margin of victory is important. Number of ballots is important, but you guys don't need to worry about that. Reply speeches. They're half the length, they garner half the marks. It's quite simple. So normally they're out of 50. Realistically, we don't go above 40. So that means, and we don't go below. 30. It's half of what's available for the constructive speech. So, for content, minimum of 12. If it's the worst content in a reply speech you've ever seen, if it's the worst style you've ever seen, if they stand there and go blah, 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 and sit down, they still get 30 points. Maximum 16, 16, and 8. As I said, these are just guidelines to help those of you that are less experienced in this format. Okay, general principles. Don't intervene in the debate. Very, very tempting, particularly if you see somebody who's really struggling to kind of help them along or encourage them. Don't do it, it's not fair on the other debaters. If somebody's struggling, unfortunately, you just have to let them struggle a bit. The only time it's really acceptable for a judge to intervene is if another team is barracking and barraging with points of information being offered. If they can see somebody is nervous, 
and struggling, they might think it's an opportunity to get in six or seven points of information. Happily stop them from doing that, okay? Nobody wins extra prizes for beating up kids. Okay? It would be like Barcelona taking on Neesden under 12s and then feeling good about themselves because they'd scored more goals than they ever had done before. It's not fun, it's not clever, and we probably shouldn't encourage it. Certainly don't intervene in the debate when you come to evaluate arguments. Do not bring your knowledge into the debate. Judge the arguments that you've heard, not the arguments you wanted to hear, not the arguments you thought should have been made, and don't do what I used to be guilty of, which is hearing an argument that you like and then working out how it was made or how it could be made better and then deciding that that was how it was really made in the debate. It's incredibly tempting to do so, particularly when, like most of us, you are former debaters. It's hard to stop ourselves from thinking, oh, I like this point, but I'd say it in this way. Don't mark the way you would like the point to be heard. Mark what is actually put out there by the debaters. When it comes to factual information in the debate, if it is general, available knowledge that we think everybody should know, it is fine for you to disregard content that is factually inaccurate. What do I mean by that? I mean that this is not American parliamentary debating. You do not need somebody to negate the idea that the earth is flat to know that the earth is not flat. If proposition contend that the earth is flat, then they are stupid and should be treated as such. We don't need opposition to tell us that the earth is not flat. If, however, proposition introduce factual information about the situation in a particular country, and you happen to know because you are a specialist of that country, or even a resident of that country, that the information is not correct, that might not be something it's legitimate for you to disregard because it might be something that they believe to be true from their research and that also might need negating by the other side. Okay? So be careful with factual information. Evaluate for yourselves how readily available, how commonly known that information is. If it's clearly erroneous and seems designed to skew the debate or uh, reduce the burden in favour of one team, then you should probably disregard it. That doesn't mean you mark negatively, it means you simply don't give any positive credit for that information they've wasted that minute or whatever of their speech. But interventionist judging is a problem in lots of debating. Okay? You all judge independently, there will be more than one judge in each debate, you all fill out your own ballot, you don't discuss it. You complete your own ballots and you sign them off, and only then do you have your discussion before you engage in feedback. Okay? But don't be swayed by what other judges think. Try not to comment to each other during the debate, which I've heard, seen and heard some judges do. When I used to judge at world schools, when a student would say something and the judge on my left would go, well, we know that's not true. You might. I don't. I'm not going to intervene in the, on that level in the debate. When it comes to feedback, please, please keep it constructive. Okay? You might think that you know a lot about a subject, but feedback is not a chance for you to show off your knowledge. It's a chance for you to help these children improve their debating. Confine your feedback to the debate itself. Do not talk about things that might be too personal, certainly not in group feedback. If you feel you need to say something to an individual, say it to them on a private level, okay? We don't want kids leaving debate rooms in tears, feeling that they were the reason their team lost. Teams prep together, and they therefore win or lose together. It's no one individual's fault, usually, that a team loses a debate. Now, we all have seen debates where it was clearly the fault of one individual. I want you to be euphemistic as possible when dealing with that situation, make them believe that this is a team effort, and then you might want to quietly take somebody aside and say, a third speech really, in terms of the role fulfillment, isn't what you gave, and so you, know, you want to be careful about that in the future. Whatever you give in feedback, you should try to give it in certain ways. That is, this is an element which we consider in the debate. This is how we perceive that element in this debate. This is the evaluation we've given that element in this debate. This is what you might need to do to improve that in contribution to the debate in the next round. Every single time you critique something about a student or a team's performance, 
please give them a way in which you think that performance could be improved next. That's what I mean by constructive feedback. We aim to build on the students' experience and make them better debaters from round to round. That's not going to work for all of them because some of the subjects might be more difficult. But the general trend in terms of speaker marks should be that they're speaking at lower levels at the beginning of the tournament and higher levels at the end. If they're not doing that, then there's probably a question about the quality of our feedback. Okay? One or two students not improving, fine. Some students having the odd blip and going down in a debate because it was a difficult topic, fine. All students stagnating or even dropping means we're not doing our job in the feedback element of judging, which is essentially a coaching role. Okay. So deal with the debate and not people and keep individual comments where you have to make them private. Personally, I try not to comment too much on personal style because it's a very, very subjective thing and students can often feel like they're being personally attacked even when they're not. No matter how gently you try to phrase things, no matter how careful you are with your words when you say, obviously every accent is lovely and we all enjoy them, however, if an accent is very strong, it can sometimes be a barrier to communication, that's something always better said in private. Because it's something very personal to that individual, and we don't want them to feel like they're being attacked. In terms of the timings for the debate, please complete your ballots as quickly as possible. That doesn't mean rush through them. Take the time you need to read through your notes to evaluate the debate as you see fit. I've just reminded myself that I forgot something in terms of evaluation, and that is obviously role fulfillment. Okay? The specific roles of the speakers on the table, in terms of setting up the debate in first proposition, response in first opposition, moving the debate on in the second position, the deconstructive element of the third speeches, there should be no new material. Those are the everyday and obvious rules that I feel you all should know anyway. Also, time your feedback, please. You'll have a timer with you because you'll be timing speeches. Please time the feedback as well. There shouldn't be any need to keep the debaters in the room for longer than about 15 or 20 minutes once ballots have been returned. That's not so important today because we only have one round, but might be more important tomorrow where we want the debaters to have a bit of a break in between rounds. Oh yeah. Are we writing down clashes or important factors for our decision on the ballot or just points? Just points, okay? We don't have the comment section on the ballots and I don't think we're going to be providing that kind of commentary to the debaters afterwards. So make your feedback in the room as extensive as you need it to be to make sure all six debaters have a clear idea of your justification for your decision. The last thing we want is debaters coming out of the room saying, well they said we lost but I still don't know why. Or debaters coming to Brianna, to Tuna, to me and saying, I don't like Judge X, they're biased against me. They've judged me twice, I've lost both times, and I never seem to be able to get any better. I did all the things they asked me to do, and it hasn't changed. Be very, very clear as to why they have won or lost the debate. Also, be measured in the sense of, if somebody's won a bad debate, let them know that they've won a relatively mediocre debate, that they still need to improve if they're going to win in a better room, in a better debate. If somebody's lost a good debate, make sure they feel okay about that, that their performance is still a good one objectively. For some of these children, winning and losing will be all important. Hopefully that's not the case for most of them. Hopefully, some of them see this as personal development rather than competition with each other. Competition with yourself is good. Prior focusing on the competition with each other, probably not. So the rounds are open. All rounds are open adjudication. Okay? We're not in the business of creating artificial suspense on break nights. Okay? This is a pedagogical exercise. That means that feedback is more important than the thrill of the party when we announce who's in the final. Ultimately, because it's going straight to a final on Saturday morning, there will be some element of suspense anyway. Because by the nature of the number of teams and the nature of the format, it is unlikely that there will be a clean break on number of wins. It is likely to come down to combined speaker points. 
and they won't know those. You only give them the result of the debate. You don't tell them the points margin, because we don't want to humiliate any teams. And you equally don't tell them their individual speaker points, because that does preserve some element of suspense when we announce top speaker awards. Okay? The last thing I'm going to say, and it's something, again, I forgot, but I remind myself of these things I go, as I go along. Within scoring, please please try and limit yourselves to margins that are acceptable. If they do see these ballots afterwards with their scores on, and they think they lost the debate by 60 points, then they're going to feel absolutely crushed. Okay? So be aware of the margin of victory. A decent margin of victory in world schools is anything but that's bigger than about five or six points over the team. Okay? That's still almost two points per speech in the constructive speeches, which is a big, big margin when you're dealing with half-point scales. All right? If there may well be debates where you feel that one team deserve all 60s and one team deserve all 80s. That's very, very unusual to begin with, but even in those cases, you might feel, for the sake of the children, that there is more sense in narrowing that gap a little bit just so people don't feel that they're completely out of their depth. We don't want anybody to walk away from this tournament thinking, I can't debate, I never want to do this again. Okay? We want to develop a passion for this activity because we think ongoing it's one of the best ways they develop as individuals. Not about winning, not about competition in that sense, but about personal development, and we want to encourage that as much as possible. So time your feedback so you're not keeping them in the rooms for too long. If necessary, say to them that they can come and approach you for more individual feedback <coughs> afterwards. Okay? Some of them will feel very comfortable doing that, some of them won't. But particularly where it's around before lunch, be aware that the longer you go on with feedback, the less time they have for that relaxation in between rounds which is necessary. They're then less likely to show up on time for the next round, and that delays everything. Start debates promptly, please. If a team doesn't show up, tell somebody as soon as you can. If there's nobody about, please have a number of somebody like Alyosha or Bayana to hand in your phone, written down somewhere, so you can make a quick phone call and say, I'm missing my proposition, I'm missing a wing judge, what do you want me to do? Okay? We need, in order for ballots to work, an odd number of judges in each debate, so that there can be a majority decision. Sometimes that might not be possible. If we have a situation where we can only have two judges in a debate, the, new, the normative standard is that the judge who is named first is considered the chair judge. That might be because they're a little bit more experienced in the format than you, so please don't feel that you are being denigrated in any way if you are named as a second judge on a panel of two. And if you differ from your chair judge in that instance, it's usually the case that the chair judge's vote will decide the win in the room. Again, that is done because we accept that some judges have a little bit more experience, and therefore no novice judges are there to learn as well. Are there any questions from anybody about any of the things I've said? We have, for you all, scales which should help you. Okay? From the brilliant best ever speech seen down to appalling worst ever speech seen and almost every grade in between. Use this to help you gauge your overall impression of a speech in terms of the score that speech should get. Okay? If you think a speech is excellent, it says on here, excellent is in the 76 to 79 range. If you think it's just below average, it's in the 67 to 69 range. Those are guidelines, they are not hard and fast rules. Do not do what I once saw a judge at World Schools do, which was write in his little idiot box individual scores, total them all up, and then he turned to me and he went, oh, that's weird. I thought the other team had won, but the scores say differently. They're your scores, mate. You wrote them in. If you think one team won, that should be the team that ends up with more points. The scores don't tell a different story to your impression of the debate, they reflect your impression of the debate. Okay? So if you find that your scores don't correspond to your overall impression, 
You might want to adjust those scores rather than adjust your impression to fit the maths. Speaking of maths, you should all know that a team with fewer points cannot beat a team with more points. You would be surprised how many ballots get returned with low point wins. I scored all these speeches, I came for this total, but I still think that team won. So I'm going to ignore the totals on my ballot and I'm then going to write it in the other way. If that happens, you'll be called to explain your ballot. That will delay the debating process because it means we can't draw for the next round until that's corrected. So make sure when you're adding scores up for these speakers that your totals are correct. That's usually where the errors occur, is in simple mathematics. But fortunately, most of you have smartphones. Most smartphones have a calculator app. If you're really, really bad at math, use your calculator app. Okay? Any other questions? Just to check for the final for the break, it's wins, then speaker points, and no ballots. The normal criteria is wins, then ballots. So margin of victory in terms of the number of judges you carry. If we are able to have three judges per room, then I would think that we would stick with wins, then ballots, and only then divide by speaker points. But if we're in a system without three, uh, without three judges per room, then ballots go out in their way. I don't know that for sure, but that would be, I would lean towards less importance being placed on ballots if there are only two ballots in a room. Because you might get a win, but one one on ballots and they cancel each other out. Mm. Okay? So, just from a logical point of view, I think there's less important placed on them if we don't have three judges per room. Hopefully we will have three judges per room and then we can follow the usual format, which is number of wins, number of ballots, speaker points if necessary. Okay? Anybody else? Make sure you sign off your ballot. That is your verification that these are your scores, independently made, that you've added them up correctly. The moment you put your signature on that ballot, that's when we get to come and get you and beat you up with it for making silly mistakes. <laughs> if you're not sure of a team's name or a speaker name, ask them to spell it for you. There is nothing more important than a, to an individual than their name. And there is nothing worse for an individual than someone consistently getting that name wrong. Okay, so be aware of regional variations of spellings of names you think you know well, but make sure that they are accurate. In the event that the students do see these bits of paper, misspellings of names are profoundly upsetting. Particularly if you've got an unusual name and you constantly have to spell it for people and then they appear not to listen. I usually give them the ballot to write their name. Yeah. If you do that, make sure they write legibly. Okay? You need to make sure that and you are awarding speaker points to the right speakers. So you, you need to know who's speaking first, who's speaking second, who's speaking third, who's offering the reply. When it comes to determining the top speaker, reply speeches don't factor into it because third speakers never get to make a reply speech. So we only calculate an average speaker mark based on the constructive speeches. Any other comments? Okay, thank you very much ladies and gentlemen.